don't think I have any announcements. So we'll get right into it. Our first reading comes from the first chapter of Luke, verses 69 through 79. Praise be to the Lord, God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord and prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, which by the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet, feet in the path of peace. And our opening hymn is, O Come All Ye Faithful. <laughs> Thank you. 
come. Just think. Just think about it. Back in the day of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus being born, I mean, God's people had been waiting. They'd been waiting and waiting and waiting for the baby Jesus to come, right? But they had waited and waited and waited so long. We have a movie, don't we? Yeah, about Jesus, right? Yeah, well, if you think about it, I, I, have, a, I have a movie. You never know how this is going to go, do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, is it really hard to wait sometimes? Yeah, yeah how come? Why is it so hard to wait? <laughs> right, you want it to happen, but it's not happening, and so we're waiting. Waiting and waiting and waiting. So, have you ever had something that you really looked forward to that you were waiting for? Yeah. yeah? Like what? What are some things we have to wait for sometimes? Christmas. Christmas. It never gets here, does it? It's here. It is here. You're right. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Uh, other things we have to wait for? Birthdays. Is it hard to wait for your birthday? Yeah. And presents. It's yeah. awfully hard to wait for your presents, isn't it? I well, you know, I've got a present here for you. That's a really big present, isn't it? Should we show the people out there how big this present is? It's a really big present. Wow. But you know what? We need to wait for a while. We'll wait to open it. Okay, so we'll just, we'll just set it here and we'll just kind of look at it. We're just going to wait a little bit. But, you know, it reminded me because when I was a little girl, I would go to my grandparents' house. And we were so excited because all the cousins would come back. And we were going to have Christmas together. So we'd eat a big meal. And then we were ready. Yes, that's right. Yes, you do. Okay, so if you think about it, I was waiting and waiting and waiting, but you know what happened? I was ready to open the Christmas presents, but the moms decided that they had to wash all the dishes before a single present could be opened. Is that ridiculous or what? Yes, totally ridiculous. Have you heard of paper plates, right? I mean, come on. Not at our house. So we waited. And we waited and we waited and it took forever. Can you say forever? Forever. Yes, it did. It took forever. But finally the dishes were done. The dish rags were hung up and we could open the presents. And you know what? It was worth the wait. It was really fun and exciting. So, if you think about it, back in Jesus' day, they had waited so long. Yes, she does. Boy, you're a talker, aren't you? It's genetic. It is genetic. Now, back in Jesus' day, they were waiting for him. They were waiting for this Savior to come. Yep, thumbs up is right. They had been looking forward to the promise that Jesus was going to come to this earth. But wait a second. He was born as a baby in a dirty dark, stinky, smelly barn? I mean, if I had wrote this story, I would probably make him come as a, I don't know, a rich, powerful ruler. Or wouldn't God's son come as, I don't know, riding on a white stallion here to save the day? Or wouldn't God send his son maybe on a big, mighty ship and he would, he would rescue all the people? Wow. But why was he born as a baby in a manger? Well, if you think about it, there's a reason. So let's think about this. Are any of you rich and powerful, mighty rulers? No. no, me either. What? I mean, none of us are. We're just regular old people born in regular old families, aren't we? Pretty special families, but just ordinary families. And just like that, Jesus came, and he was born in just a regular old, ordinary way. He was born in a barn, and he grew up kind of like we did. So think about this. As Jesus grew up, he would have gotten a little bit older and he would have been out running with his friends and he would have fallen and skinned his knee just like you and me. And what happens when you skin your knee? It starts to bleed. And then what happens? You cry. And then what happens? Mom's got to kiss the boo-boo, right? Got to kiss the knee and make it all better, right? So Jesus would have done that just like us. And then Jesus would have had friends maybe who hurt his feelings just like us. And Jesus would have, well, different things would have happened that would have been just like our experiences. But was Jesus just like us? Not quite. There was something special about him, right? What was special about him was that 
He was a man, but he was also God. He was God's son. So did Jesus ever sin? No way. He was perfect. And so when we would get mad, instead, he would respond with kindness, right? He was the kind of, of man that would come along, and because he was God, he would heal people's diseases. He would help the sick. He would be there to help the people who were hurting, because he was God. And that's what makes him so special. A baby born in a manger that would one day grow up to rescue us from our sins. And so that's the best part about Jesus, is that he grew up ordinary, but he wasn't ordinary. He was extraordinary, wasn't he? Because he was God, God's own son. So if you think about it, Jesus came here. He hung out with sinners like us, just regular old people. I mean, do we sometimes do things we shouldn't do, like bad things? Sometimes we do, don't we? Yep. And we do things we shouldn't do, right? And we need forgiveness. I, I got a new Spider-Man lost. Boy, do you ever. <laughs> yep. Yep. I got a new Spider-Man game. Yep. Right? We'll talk about that Spider-Man game in a little bit, okay? So, Jesus came and hung out with people like us who sometimes do bad things. But you know what? He loved us. And he loved us enough to die for us. And the best part about Jesus is that he says to us, he reaches out his hand and he says to you and to you, he says to Ledger, who's not listening, and to you, right? He says, you know what? Come to me. I love you. I love you so much that I came here to die for you. And all he wants is for us to say yes to him, to say yes to Jesus. And that's the best thing that we could ever do at Christmas, right? Is to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to forgive me of my sins, and I want to live for you. And so that's what we have an opportunity to do today, is to accept that gift. And you know what? It's worth the wait. Just like all that waiting we've had to do for other gifts. So knowing that, we're going to pray in just a minute here, okay? So let's do that. Let's fold our hands. We're going to close our eyes. And we're going to tell the adults out there to fold their hands and close their eyes too. And let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for sending Jesus born in a barn so he could live just like us. But Lord, thank you that he was God so he could save us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. And I just pray that today that we would say, yes, Jesus, I want to live for you. Let's do that this Christmas and it will be the best Christmas. Definitely worth the wait. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, I think we can go back to our seats, huh? Yeah. Oh, wait, was there something we were supposed to do? You don't know? Oh, oh, the present! Well, I think I need a little help opening this present. What do you think? Can you guys tear into it? Well, show me how it's done. You can? Oh, I know you can. <laughs> All right, rip it open. We're not saving the wrapping paper. Oh, yeah, get after it. Come on. All right. Now, in honor of Jesus' birthday, because Jesus is the best gift we could ever receive, we're going to have celebration bags that you're going to get because it's Jesus' birthday today, okay? So inside is some fun stuff for you, okay? So take a bag. And do you think there's some other kids out there who are maybe afraid to be in the program today? Maybe some bigger kids, too? Do you think you guys could pass out a few extra bags to bigger kids? Oh, good! All right, and then you can head back to your seats, and let's tell these kids good job on their program.
from the second chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born, King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod, Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for it is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them exactly the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet this Christmas Eve, we ask that the Holy Spirit would enter our hearts in joy for the gift that you gave us in your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. When we get into the Christmas season, it seems that some people understand the Christmas story by listening to Christmas carols, seeing Christmas cards, and looking at nativity scenes. I like Christmas carols, but they may not be real accurate, and we shouldn't use them as a source for our theology. For instance, Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm. When a baby is born, things are very seldom silent, or calm, or we three kings. Looking at our text in Matthew 2 today, we will notice that they are not called kings, nor does it say that there were three. So songwriters, greeting card makers, paintings, and our Christmas pageants try to gather all these elements into one place using some artistic license. Not an entirely bad thing, as long as we remember to look to the Bible for the truth. I would like to speak today about these mysterious men mentioned in Matthew 2, the Magi, or wise men. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born, the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. If you will notice, we have an indeterminate number of Magi, that came at an indeterminate time from an unspecified place somewhere to the east. In songs and nativity scenes, we hear of three magi or wise men. And our Western church tradition says that there were three, undoubtedly because of the three gifts. Early church paintings will depict the magi as two or three or even four. And the tradition of the Eastern church is that there were 12. But the text doesn't tell us how many. Also note the text says that after Jesus was born. So the Magi were not in the stable when the shepherds were there at Jesus' birth. We are not told how much after Jesus' birth they arrived. But later in the text, Jesus is described as a child, and the family was now in a house, not a stable. Scholars have different thoughts about just how long after Jesus' birth this was. Some saying as little as a few days, others up to nearly two years. The Magi were an ancient caste or tribe of heretical priests. It is thought they began in the area of Media, or the northwest of modern-day Iraq, basically north of Babylon. They had a monotheistic religion, meaning they had one god, although not the true god. There was some superstition in their religion, 
They were knowledgeable in science, math, and astronomy, the study of stars. They were interpreters of dreams. They believed in angels and demons, and even had a belief that there would be a king of the, of the world in the future. They were very learned, knowledgeable, and powerful. They sat in the courts of kings as, of, as advisors. We are told in chapter 1 of the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and took some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, and handsome, showing an aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. This learning was to take three years. They would have learned what is called the law of the Medes and the Persians. This was the knowledge of the Magi. And the person that we are most interested in this regard is the prophet Daniel. He was one of those brought to Babylon in about 605 BC to learn the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And he was a devout Jew. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream and asked the wise men, that is the Magi, to interpret it. However, none of them could. And being a harsh man, Nebuchadnezzar ordered all the Magi executed. Before that happened, Daniel stepped forward. And Daniel, through God, interpreted the dream. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? When Joseph, through God, interpreted the Pharaoh's dream in Egypt. Daniel, therefore, saved the lives of the Magi. Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed by Daniel that we read in chapter 2, verse 48 of the book of Daniel. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts upon him. He made, a rule, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Daniel was in the royal court. Later we will read that he was the third most powerful man in the kingdom, behind the king and the king's son. Being the ruler of the Magi, or wise men, and a devout Jew, Daniel would have shared his knowledge of the Old Testament and the prophets. And when the Magi tell Herod that they were looking for one who has been born king of the Jews because they had seen his star rising in the east, perhaps they know of the prophecy of Belim from Numbers 24 or 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Daniel had prophesied the coming of the Messiah King as well. We don't know how this star manifested itself. There are many documentaries and books speculating on planetary conjunctions or comets or supernovas. We don't know. But whatever it was, God was able to make it happen in a way that the learned Magi would understand. Some of the Magi would have become God-fearing Gentiles and believed in the true God and the promise of the coming king. They received the word from the star and from the prophets that a king had been born, and that is enough for them to go to Jerusalem to find him and to crown him God's promised king. The Magi were the official kingmakers of the East. Nobody is appointed king in the Middle Eastern empires unless they are affirm affirmed by the Magi. They are given that authority by their high level of elite status. It is their responsibility to identify kings, and no one reigns without their approval, and they are looking for a new king. At the time of the birth of Christ, there were two great empires, the Roman Empire to the west and the Parthian Empire to the east. The area around Jerusalem, Israel, and what we call the Holy Land, was under Roman control. But not too far to the east was the Parthian Empire, of which Mesopotamia was a part, the area of Babylon, and continuing east to India. The Magi were from this area. The text doesn't tell us how far east, a few hundred miles, probably the area of Babylonia, perhaps the city of Babylon itself. At any rate, not an insignificant journey. Add to that, Rome and Parthia are enemies. They were at war off and on for hundreds of years. The Magi, however, were not interested in war, but in spiritual matters. 
We can assume that they were God-fearing Gentiles, although they came from a pagan country. The influence of Daniel and the Jews who remained in that region had given them the knowledge of the Old Testament and the promise that God had made concerning the coming of the king. So as they come to Jerusalem, they ask, where is the one born king of the Jews? So they can worship him. They are not on a political mission or a military mission. They have come to worship. And where would you expect to find a king? Well, where the palace was, in the capital city of Jerusalem. We read that Herod heard this. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And the Greek word used here means to be greatly disturbed or greatly troubled. The Magi arriving in Jews Jerusalem would not have been three men on camels like our Christmas cards show. The number of actual Magi may have been small, but they would have traveled with a large entourage of cooks, animal keepers, and guards, perhaps soldiers. After all, traveling along those routes was dangerous, and they had valuables in their possession. There were robber bandits along the way, and they were essentially crossing an international border to a country that was not friendly with their own country. This may have looked threatening to Herod and to the people of Jerusalem, and this group of people was large enough that it would not go unnoticed. But what troubled Herod the most was the question, where is the one born king of the Jews? And the problem is there already is a king of the Jews, and they were looking at it, King Herod. He was given that title by the Roman Senate. Now Herod was an Edomite, and the Jews and the Edomites have not been on friendly terms. But they probably still thought he was better than a Roman. There are seven Herods mentioned in the New Testament. It was a family name. This Herod is Herod the Great. The others are sons and grandsons of this man. His father was a ruler over parts of Judea and made Herod governor of the region of Galilee. When Herod's father was assassinated, he stepped in to assume that role. And the Romans were going through their own internal conflicts and civil wars at this time. You remember Julius Caesar, he was assassinated in 44 BC. And then we have Octavian and Mark Antony. Herod hoped to hold on to power, and as long as he didn't do anything to upset the apple cart, Rome was okay with that. The good things Herod is remembered for are his building projects. He was a great builder. He built a great palace in Jerusalem. He built the city of Caesarea Maritina, a hippodrome, and began building on the temple in Jerusalem. He appointed his brother-in-law as high priest, but his brother-in-law was more popular than Herod, and he mysteriously died. As Herod aged, he became more and more jealous and more and more suspicious. He accused one of his wives of infidelity and had her executed. Becoming an insane madman, he thought two of his sons were after his throne, so he had them executed. He had another brother-in-law executed, and later still another son for the same reason as the first two. So when the Magi asked about another king of the Jews, he became fearful and wanted to eliminate this new king. The Magi who have come to worship have nothing to guide them but the testimony of the Jewish prophets and the Old Testament. They are skilled scientists, but their science is mixed with superstition. They are astronomers and astrologers. They are enthusiastically engaging in a long journey from the Middle East. They seem to be convinced that God is the true God, and the Old Testament is the true book, and Jesus is the true King. They are in contrast to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. The rabbis, the scribes, the chief priests were indifferent to the birth of Jesus Christ. This is what John means when we read in the first chapter of John, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But we have Gentiles from afar who have come to worship him. His own people refused to worship him, and in the end had him murdered by the Romans. They would have thought that Herod would be looking for the king promised by the prophets as well. The wise, wise men would have thought that Herod would know exactly where he was. This was not the case. The city with the scriptures had no knowledge of the king that had been born, and no interest in the king that had been born. They were self-satisfied. 
They were rejectors. From the beginning to the end. And this story mimics the whole story of these rejectors. There was no room for him in the inn. There was no room for him in the temple. And there was no room for him in their hearts. Herod gathered the religious leaders and asked them where the Messiah is to be born. And they quoted the prophet Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. They knew the Old Testament and the prophets, but they refused to see that it had happened. Herod puts on an act and calls the Magi secretly and asks them exactly when the star had appeared to know the birth of the child so that he could tell the age of the child. So he can find him and eliminate him. And he can't be looking at every boy child. He needs to narrow it down. He wants more detail. Herod tells the Magi, go and search carefully for the child and to report back to him so he can worship him too. We know that he had no intention to worship Jesus. Sometimes we think that the star led them all away, but in the text it seems they saw a star telling them the birth in Israel and didn't see the star again until after they met with Herod. When they see the star again, it appears over Bethlehem, and they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. They were excited. The star led them to Bethlehem, where they found the child and his mother in a house. Notice that Jesus is now called a child, <coughs> not a baby. And they are not in a stable, but in a house. And that the Herod and the religious leaders didn't see the star, or didn't care enough to notice. And when they saw him, the Magi, they bowed down and worshipped him. And they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Notice that before they gave the gifts, they gave their hearts. They worshipped him. This is an example for us. We often talk about our Christian responsibility to give up our time, our talents, and our treasures. And we should, of course. But before we give up these things, we need to give up ourselves. To give our very heart so that these things are an outflow of our worshipping heart. The Magi gave him gifts. The first one mentioned is gold. Gold was a gift for a king. We all know that gold is valuable. It was in ancient times, it still is today. In ancient times, if you had an audience with a king, you were expected to bring a gift of value, usually gold. When the queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she brought 120 talents of gold, among other valuable gifts. Gold is a gift suitable for a king. Frankincense is a less clear gift. Although it was valuable as well, it is a dried rosin from a tree. The tree is wounded, and the rosin bleeds from the tree, and the dried rosin is collected. It was burned as incense in the temple. In the Bible, it is always for God. This signifies Jesus' deity. The last gift, myrrh, is a strange gift for a child. It was a rosin from a tree, collected much like frankincense. It was used for perfuming. It was a smelly world. In Proverbs, we read it with, of it being used to perfume a bed. It was used to perfume clothes. It could be mixed with wine and drank as a painkiller. Remember, Jesus refused it at the cross. But mostly it was used in the burial of the dead to perfume the body. A strange gift for a child unless that ch child was born to die. When you see a depiction of baby Jesus in a manger, you should also see the shadow of the cross on the manger. God had kept Jesus, Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem until Jesus had been coronated. The Magi identified Jesus by these gifts, gold for a king, myrrh for a man, and frankincense for God. God spoke to the Magi in a dream and warned them of Herod, and they returned to their country by a different route. God warned Joseph in a dream that Herod was trying to kill Jesus <coughs> and to escape to Egypt. Perhaps the gift of gold financed their stay in Egypt. The Magi were wise men. They were wise in their decision. The journey of the wise men is one of faith. 
Where is the one born king of the Jews? We have seen a star in the east. What would make someone leave their homes to go on a dangerous journey? Romance? Maybe. Wealth? Certainly. But faith? Yes, faith. They had seen a star and they knew that he had been born. All they had to do was find him. And they were willing to risk everything. People of faith are willing to make the decision to follow the ways of God, even in discomfort. They were wise in their determination. These wise men traveled hundreds of miles, dangerous miles. They must have been mocked for chasing a star. They were determined despite the ridicule and expense. They would have had troubles and setbacks along the way, but they were determined. How determined are you to follow the Lord? They were wise in their discernment. Herod tells the Magi to search carefully for the child and to report back to him so he could worship him too. They were wise to see through the jealousy and evil of King Herod. A person of wisdom is a person of discernment. A person who can tell right from wrong can do right. They were wise in their devotion. The purpose of their journey was to worship. They brought gifts. But the greatest gift is to give of yourself. They were wise in their departure. Being warned in a dream, they departed to their own country by another way. After they worshipped Jesus, they couldn't go back the way they had come. Once you have met God, once you have accepted God, you will never be the same. Jacob wrestled with God, and he walked with a limp the rest of his life. Isaiah stepped into the presence of God and said, Woe is me, for I am undone, a man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, and he was never the same. When we walk in the presence of God, we are changed. The wise women, wise men met Jesus and they were changed. Herod was probably not going to kill the Magi. That would start an international incident and maybe a war between Rome and Parthia. But he thinks that he needs to find this king of the Jews and kill him. He knows it would be easier to kill one child than to start a war he may not win. In verse 16, Herod realizes that he has been outwitted and is angry, so he has all the male children, two years and under, in Bethlehem region killed. In this text in Matthew 2, we find three groups of people. We have those who reject Jesus, Herod, and the religious leaders. Those who want to do things their own way. Remember those at the crucifixion who said, we will not have this man reign over us. The haters. Then we have the indifferent, those who couldn't care less about Jesus. They just go about doing their thing at the temple. He means nothing to them, and they don't need him. And then we have the worshiping magi, the wise men, foreigners, who worship with exceedingly great joy. And we need to ask ourselves, which group am I in? Because the first two groups are going to come to a bad end. We need to be joyfully worshiping. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, allow us to joyfully worship the greatest gift that you have given us, the gift of your Son, as we celebrate on this Christmas Eve. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now we have some special music. <laughs>
all who must be out in the elements, the first responders, the male personnel, the linemen, and so many others. Keep them safe as they keep us safe. We pray for those who are not here today. If they are not here because of travel issues or health issues or whatever the reason, we ask you to bless and keep them close to you. Be with all those traveling at this time of the year when travel can be especially tough. Keep them safe as well. We ask your comfort on those who are mourning the loss of a loved one at this special time of year. Comfort them as only you can. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of this cup, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now as our Lord taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And now, at Writing Rob, we have an open table. Everyone's welcome to have communion. If that's not your tradition, uh, you don't have to. All we ask is that you uh, truly repent for your sins and believe that Jesus died, died for your sins. So we'll uh, start on this side and come off the outside and go down the middle, put your used cups in the uh, wicker basket. And I think we're ready to go.
our crucified our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now bestowed on you his holy body and blood whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting peace be with you amen we thank you almighty and everlasting God for having refreshed us with these gracious gifts we ask in your infinite mercy to strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us to love you with all our heart and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Angels we have heard on high.
love bless you and keep you. May the very face of God, God shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you eternal peace. Amen. Merry Christmas. We have some uh, bags of goodies, peanuts. Be sure to pick one of them up on your mail. Thank you much.